Hello and welcome to episode three of the Cars.co's podcast. My name is Chira de Siena and our guest in studio today is Dave the Car Guy. Hello Chira, how are you? <laughs> Hello Dave. And this is quite an auspicious occasion because it's Dave's birthday. Yeah, somehow level 35. <laughs> level 35. Yeah, cheers to that. Thanks Dave. And Dave has very kindly brought us some donuts, which I'm definitely going to snack on. So excuse me if I snack on one through the show. I'm a little bit hungry. We have our, we've come prepared. We have our tea. We have our tea. And yeah. our cars are yeah. mugs. We should, we should give some of these away. Because we're grown up. And yeah. we actually should. Yeah. We actually should. I think, I think we should. I haven't planned this at all. Mm. This has just come to me. So I think in some way through the podcast, we should give away some mugs. I think some people definitely, might definitely like some cars mugs. We should have enough viewers. Yeah. People like what we do. Okay. We'll find a way to give away some mugs. But coming up in today's episode, we will be reviewing a full on military vehicle which we were invited to drive outside Pretoria last week. It's called the SVI Max. I can't wait to tell you about it, Dave. And that actually, uh, and springboarding from that, we'll actually be having a bit of a military themed show because Dave and I share a sort of interest in really weird obscure military vehicles i like how you say interest as as if it's acceptable because it's actually a bit of a, a closet nerd obs- obsession okay <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get stuck into that at the end of the show and in the middle we'll be reviewing the new renault megan trophy we'll be offering some buying advice around the subaru forester we'll be chatting about our recent sentimental shoots wow quite a Quite a thing we put together up in Joburg with our film crew and the help of a, a, a bunch of really cool South African racing drivers. Can't wait to share some stories around that. Um, and then, of course, ending off with some uh, chats about obscure Russian military hardware. It's going to be a good show. But let's kick off the show with a chat about the SVI Engineering Max 9, a locally developed and built military vehicle. Dave, you've seen some pictures. What do you think of it? Man, that is one badass little military truck i mean and it's it's awesome to see because i mean you, you'd think with military hardware you'd either have two dominating countries building everything but for south africa to be building really cool modern advanced warfare yeah that's that's a rad little toy we punch above our weight in yeah terms of definitely sort of stuff. definitely yeah. i'm not sure how i feel about army vehicles and guns and all the rest of it but i do feel very privileged to have experienced it i mean these things exist I'd like to drive everything. That's kind of my aim. Um, take, take me with you. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. So we did get to film. It's coming to our YouTube channel soon. And I don't want to give away too much because it was one of the most extraordinary days I've had shooting vehicles ever. So I don't want to give away too much, but some bare bones facts about it. It weighs eight tons. Same as four Range Rovers. <laughs> it has a thousand Newton meter Cummins turbo diesel engine. It's an auto, which does make life a little mm. bit easier. Uh, it has eight mil Swedish armor plating, which is pretty much solid up until bazooka. That's about the only thing that can get through that, an RPG. <laughs> you can fit a two million Rand gun turret onto the roof, a 50 cal, um, which they actually let me shoot. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, we did shoot. I'm not a- jealous, not at all. <laughs> not at all. That's quite a thing, yeah. That's like setting off a bomb. Cheapest. Yeah. War's so, not for sissies, is yeah. it? Yeah. And it just feels it feels like quite a dangerous thing. That like a fifty yeah. cal round is about. It's a good, you know. <laughs> and, uh, is is there one on our site? What an SVI Max and, yeah. or a fifty cal? Can we gun? put a, Can we put in a lead? <laughs> Can we so get one in red? Definitely, yeah. So definitely <laughs> one of the most extraordinary things um, I've ever reviewed. Can't wait to put the video together. Give us a little bit of time for that one because there's so much footage. So it's going to take a bit of time to edit. Um, but in the meantime, uh, let's review something a little more accessible. Um, something that's not particularly designed to go to war. But that actually does sound like a little bit of a war zone. The Renault McGann Trophy. Uh, Dave, I didn't drive this thing. You did. Um, the latest RS300 trophy. What did you think of it? Um, I had to rewire my brain because I've, I've actually forgotten how to drive a performance manual hot hatch. I mean, we've been spoiled. I and mean, we've had the lovely Golf R. Put the thing in drive. Off you go. I mean, it's, it's simple. It's, it's a really easy to operate. This thing is offered in both dual clutch and, and manual. We had the manual one on test. Had, had, uh, it has four wheel steer which really makes things very interesting. And it requires some proper brain power and, and, and thoughts on how to get the best out of it. I mean, when you really get going, the way this thing attacks corners is it's incredible. I mean, I don't think I've ever gone around some of these mountain passes ever that quick. 
in machines costing twice as much. It's a proper riot. So it's, it's a, a fast vehicle. It's a lunatic. But I don't know. Since I've turned 35, I think I think uh, middle-aged... <laughs> six hours yes. ago. Yeah. <laughs> Mid- middle-aged Dave is, to be blunt, getting too old for this nonsense. I, I just I just want to be comfortable. I mean, 25-year-old Dave would have loved the idea of a yellow McGann RS to go hurtling around and yeah. chasing after GTIs. But this thing, I got out of it and I felt like I'd been in a, in a boxing ring and been sparred and smashed about. It's, <laughs> it requires effort and it's not going to be to everyone's taste. But when you get it right, it is... Awesomely good fun. So it's a car for a quick blast, not something to live with. Yeah, I go with that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think if you had the perfect opportunity, you'd have a Golf R Monday to Friday, and then Friday afternoon you run with a giggle, go jump into your trophy, smash it around for the weekend, drive to a track day, hunt down all the mountain passes, and then Monday morning get back into the golf and be really thankful. <laughs> and I think we should provide some context to our lovely audience because Dave is a bit of a Frenchophile? Francophile, good. <laughs> I got there eventually when it comes to cars. And you do love a, a fast yellow French thing. And I know this about you. I've known you for a yeah. long time now. So for you not to really like this car or not to be able to fully recommend it is actually saying quite a lot. Yeah, it was... I had to I had to try to motivate myself to drive this thing hard and like every little rut and imperfection on the road was coming through my spine and i was like oh but these <laughs> seats are so good oh listen to that acropovich exhaust barking away and it's like oh this is hard and then suddenly the traffic would clear foot flat and away you go and then it'll be like oh yeah this is this is this is good fun. this is good this yeah. is good fun. okay so it's maybe a little bit of a one trick pony maybe a bit compromised i've got our compare tool up here on cars at Coza. it's a really wonderful tool if you haven't used it before you can comprehensively compare three cars side by side so i pulled up the rs300 trophy next to the honda i30 n which which not necessarily a direct rival but it is interesting it's just arrived in the country and then the the stalwart that you've been discussing the volkswagen golf golf r which is due to be replaced Mm. very 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 soon um at least on the internet if not in showrooms until what 2021 2022 maybe we'll see golf gtr arrive in south africa probably first quarter next year and then golf R the reveal online is is due i think in the next couple of weeks or month or so all right so golf R, yeah 2021 it's one to look forward to we'll lay eyes on it soon um of the of the three i've pulled up here though the megan is the most expensive 774 for the megan 679 for the i30 n 727 for the Volkswagen Golf R. So, I mean, it's a good 100K mm. more than the Hyundai i30N, which you got to drive as well. Yeah, I, I like that i30N. You know what, for for everyone judges that, that Hyundai i30N, oh no, you can't charge that much for a Hyundai. And you know what, when you, it's, it's another one of those cars where you have to really spend time with it to get it right. But that i30N is a terrific offering. And I've seen used examples on our site and they're, they're coming down quite nicely. And I think give it a, another six months to a year, you'll see them under 600K. So are there some on our site? Oh, yes. Really? Yeah. Yep. But then what are they, new or demos? They're or? demos. So they'll have between 10 and 15,000 Ks on the clock. So yeah. they, there's a handful of units floating around. Oh, I'm quite interested in this because I didn't get to drive it. So maybe I have to oh. buy the bloody things. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great first attempt by Hyundai. So and, and you get to drive it. They're, they're going to be putting N performance on the entire portfolio. So you're going to have a Veloster N soon if you want a compact SUV with insane yeah. power. So the i20N is coming as well if you want to hunt down some Polo GTIs. So the Hyundai in i30, let's uh, let's see if we can find one here. Price, high to low. There's one straight off the bat. Wow, 599. There you go. What that's, color? That's a good 80K off list. Yeah. What and we've color? got quite a few, eh? Well, there's, there's a pinkish one, although I imagine it's red. That's just a bad photo. There's a black one, a blue one, two white, three white ones, there a sort of go. a gray one, another red. Okay, so there's some sitting on showroom floors. Eh? I mean, it is a depressed market, yeah. let's be honest. But wow, some bargains to be had out yeah, there. Yeah, definitely. Eh? I mean, with new car pricing going through the yeah. roof, I mean, you can quite easily get a really nice one or two-year-old performance car for 450, 500K now. 
There, this is some fantastic consumer advice we've accidentally stumbled on here, Dave. If you would like a high-end i30 n for under 600k, you can get one right now on our site. You've got about six to choose from, which is quite interesting. Alrighty, so there we go. Let's wrap that up there. Uh, that is your Megan Trophy review. Moving on, uh, we're going to do a little bit of Subaru Forester buying advice. But I think first, I'd like to chat about our sentimental shoots. Um, which unfortunately the whole team wasn't on because it was up in Joburg mm. and it's difficult to travel at the moment and all the rest of it. But I just wanted to um, quickly uh, tell the audience and, and everyone listening that you're, that uh, we we put together something we've been dreaming of for a while. It's coming to the YouTube channel soon and I'm sure there'll be lots of written content as well. We put our one of our three to five ISs, the Evo one, up against the Super Boss. And normally it would be maybe me or you or me, mm. me or uh, myself or Ash, Ashley Oldfield, our tame racing driver, uh, putting them, you know, putting them head to head. But this time we got hold of two special gentlemen, Mr. Mike Briggs, uh, who's famous for taking the Super Boss to three championship wins back in the 90s in Group N. And a good friend of the company and all of us, Dion Hubert, um, who's very famous for having a cracking career behind the wheel of a, a 325 IS. And... It was a really good day. It was a good a good couple of days out, actually, and got to have dinner with the guys, and they are full of stories. Oh, I can imagine the banter must have been on another, another level. M- Mike is hilarious. They both He's are. Such a, yeah, I mean, they're <laughs> such characters. Yeah, and they were naughty when they were, <laughs> when they were at the height of their careers. Also, had, uh, they had some funny anecdotes about the legend Sorrel van der Berwe, which was quite funny. And yeah, both of our cars went home broken. Um <laughs> basically completely stuffed it, it's called wear and tear <laughs> and it was yeah. dynamic testing so we can write it off it's yeah. a shooting expense that was some very um compressed wear and tear into 24 hours <laughs> <laughs> the important question is Jerry, did you get to drive any of those cars i did so for our channel i got to review i did a track review on our 325 is our evo one and not that you're a, a fan of the e30 or oh. anything but did it did it hurt? Did it did it hurt to meet your hero? So yes and no, and I think it's not entirely the car's fault. So we've got we'll put some pictures on the screen, but we've got two Evo ones in the cars of Coza Fleet. Mm-hmm. Sorry, uh, two three to five ISs. We've got the Evo one and the Evo two. The Evo one is quite special because it's Evo one number one. It's also oh, wow. the only Dolphin Grey one in the world. So and it's the car that BMW used to make the marketing material. No wonder Hannes has been hiding it from us. Yes, yeah, I know. It's in his lair in Pinelands. Yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, actually, I can confirm it's not it's in Joburg. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you, 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 you know, we, I've driven more expensive cars, hmm. but I don't think I've driven something that's so irreplaceable. And um, driving at home was terrifying from the track. Uh, at the moment, it has a bit of an idling problem, which, we, which we're trying to sort out. So that was fun, getting stuck on the highway in bumper-to-bumper traffic. I mean, I didn't get stuck, but I was, mm. I was in the traffic and in yeah. a car that doesn't idle, in a car that occasionally needs a push start uh, in the middle of nowhere. Well, that's not, that's not yeah. uh, stress-free at all, is it? No, but, but driving <laughs> it on the track, yeah, it did live up to the hype. Yeah, it how, was good. How badly do you want one? Oh, so badly. <laughs> really, I, I would just park it and stare at it, I think. I put it in my lounge. <laughs> I just have it in the dining room. <laughs> I mean, I, it's I, a wonderful I, thing. I look at the number of requests we get of people looking for cars and the number of people who go, hi, I'm looking for an E30 325 IS. And the temptation to reply to these users is, me too, man. Me too. <laughs> and I, you have to say very politely, like this, this, is, this car is a museum piece. It's, yeah. it's a piece of history. Like trying to find one now, I mean, like, it yeah. must be impossibly rare yeah i mean the super bus even even rarer our alpha is even yeah. rarer than that um you you're probably better off trying to find a 325i sport which was very similar that was launched in europe and actually just importing it mm. probably cheaper actually because they're not as they're not as sought after yeah. i mean this is the gushesh you know mm. this thing is like a national hero i mean when i when i drove people were losing their minds when they saw my car i mean taxi drivers just leaning out the window just like yeah, like I felt like Sio Khaleesi or something <laughs> like that. I was, like, I was like, wow, this is incredible. Um, no, they're special cars. And, and you know what was nice as well was Dion and Mike kept saying that what Cars of Cars is doing with our sentimental fleet is so important. You know, we're, pre- we're preserving South Africa's really rich car heritage. And I'm very proud to be a part of that. Yeah. Really nice. Whether we get to drive all of them is another story. Yeah, but yeah. You're gonna have I to mean, I've got my eye your... on that, that, that Capri Piranha. 
<laughs> I mean, just a, just a nice little tidy Ford V8 rumbling away there. Yeah. I mentioned this to Hannes, and he just looked at me as if like, I keyed his car. <laughs> <laughs> Don't yeah, you let me drive it? Let's get a picture of that on the screen. Yeah, I mean, we presented <laughs> them all at the Cars Awards. We've got some cool footage of that, which we'll put up now. We, we got all five of them onto the stage. Yeah. Uh, the Alpha made its debut. No, it, we, we've got a... I feel very privileged, very grateful to be to be part of this. Uh, we are basically curators of a museum. Yeah, yeah, we are sort of creators, and we get to drive them. You're going to have to get your backside to Joburg suit. You got to go drive those things. I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> There's flights. If interprovincial travel is now allowed for leisure, yes. but this is work. Yeah, so this is serious. There we go. It can happen. There we go. Alrighty. Um, so yeah, a, a bunch of videos coming to our channel soon. We we sent some of our crew on a two week uh, trip around Joe, uh, South Africa, shooting some really special cars, shooting our special cars, uh, shooting military vehicles. So we've got a lot of post production to do, um, and uh, we'll roll the videos out on the channel as soon as we can. So best to get over there and subscribe uh, so that you're the first to know about all the cool videos dropping right we said we'd do some subaru forester buying advice dave i think we can wrap this up quickly should you buy a subaru forester yes cool <laughs> moving on um <laughs> oh if only it was that easy <laughs> so you, you've got a forester in the family hey? yeah my parents are on their second forester so the first one they had was the 2.5 xs and then uh, that unfortunately was written off in a in a freak car accident oh no yeah I mean, my parents were absolutely fine which which was testament to the subaru safety i mean got sideswiped by a truck on the N1 when they, when they relocated. I think it was 2010, 2011. And my parents were kind of sold. I mean, a lot of people were like, oh, no, don't buy another Subaru. And then my parents are going, uh, yeah, we absolutely are. Yeah, it saved our So now they've bought a, a Forester 2-liter diesel. And unfortunately, Subaru is no longer doing a diesel motor for our market. Mm. So they are holding on to that thing. Like, it's, it's precious. And for, uh, for I'm, not, I'm mm. not up to sorry to interrupt you. No. I'm, not, I'm not up to date on the Subaru Forester pricing. So I'll, I'll pull that up while you carry on. Yeah, have a look. I mean, there's a, there's a lot to like about the Forester. I mean, it, sure, it's not as glamorous or flashy or tech laden as some of its rivals, but there's no denying that that thing, when when the road runs out and you turn into uh, gravel and stones, you want to be in a Forester. Mm. I mean, it, that all wheel drive just grips and goes. Mm. Some of them, I think, have low range if memory serves, so they can go even further. Ground clearance is fantastic. There's loads of interior space. The, some mm. of the modern ones now have autonomous emergency braking. So, oh, yeah, new eyesight yeah. feature. Yeah, it's really impressive. Do you want to hear some cool trivia about the Subaru Forester? Go for Because my brain is just full of this nonsense. Go for but, it. Um, I'm, I'm ready. In America, in the US of A, they did a, there was a survey done, quite a large survey. And the, the question was, um, or the, the, the aim was to find out which car model is retained the longest by its owners. And the winner was the Subaru Forester. And the average ownership period mm. of a Subaru Forester is 10 years in America. <laughs> 10 years for a car lifespan. I mean, that's almost unheard that's of. That's unheard of. And we've days. got most modern motoring manufacturers who are churning out a facelift and a mm. subsequent new model within four, five, six years. Yeah. And I, I was told by an, a local ex-Subaru dealer, dealer principal that... One of the biggest problems they have is that they can't get secondhand stock because people don't want to let go of them. Yeah, understandable. Yeah, and I mean that's pretty that's a pretty cool testament to to how good those cars are to live with. I mean, a quick comparison up here on our compare tool. Um, I've got it up against the Rav Four. Uh, what else do you think we could put it up against? Nissan X Trail. Yeah, you could sense, put an X Trail in there because you get a nice off roady type X Trail. You so could put a Ford Cougar in there if if anyone wants to be brave enough to buy a Cougar. <laughs> let's uh, let's hoy a let's hoy the 1.5 DCI Techno because you know the thing about the Forest is it gives you that all wheel drive. Yeah, uh, which you have to pay a bit extra for in other mm. cars. So you can get into a Forester for 476 it's the brand new one it's actually quite a good looking vehicle I think um, you can get into a RAV4 for quite a bit more 550, mm. 552 and about the same money for a diesel 4x4 X-Trail so Dave I'm not going to ask you which one you would have uh, I think that's a foregone conclusion yeah <laughs> I mean, like, Forest has always been a left field choice I mean mm. those those who've owned them and experienced them love them and yeah. as you say they're not going to part ways with them mm. They're just good cars. I mean, they're honest, unpretentious. They're there, semi in a semi workhorse environment. Yeah, and off you go. I think they I think they represent good second hand value. We've got plenty of them on our site. Yeah. And um, the one thing to look out for, though, apparently, is the boxer engine occasionally suffers with oil starvation issues. Mm. I think. 
Um, so that's something to keep an eye on. Um, other than that, very few problems with the cars reported, yeah. uh, which is great. So if you're looking for a new one, looking for a used one, uh, you'll definitely find uh, one on our site. And um, oh, it's been great chatting to you, Dave. Do you want a donut? So no, yeah, I'm just hogging I've, the donuts. I've, I've had one already. You I'm had, trying to okay. watch my figure. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they're for the team. Don't right, dive in, great. dive in. Well, well, thank you very much. No for worries. Um, so as, as stated at the beginning, let's wrap up with a chat about some random military hardware. Now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was browsing the mean streets of Twitter and I came across one of the most extraordinary vehicles I've ever seen in my life. It was a giant Russian Ekranoplan. And it was nuclear, nuclear enabled, not nuclear enabled, but it could shoot nuclear warheads. And I sent the link to Dave and, and Dave was just like, what is this thing? And I, I know you went off and did a bit of research on it. So what's quite interesting is they're turning, they're turning it in. We'll, we'll put a picture on the screen because you just have to see this thing to believe it. But they're turning it into a museum, I believe. Yeah, correct. So the Krona plan was basically a flying boat. Uh, you got to love war because... Yes, sure, there's nasties involved and whatever, but you've got to admire the, techno the technological advances where people will try to outdo each other. So along came this thing, which is flying boat, eight turbojet engines, and it hovered. So it used the thing called ground effect. So the faster you go, the closer you got to the, the Earth. It was almost impossible to crash. So it would essentially just hover at high speed, and it could do sand, ice, water. So what, what the premise was, this thing would fly around, at incredibly high speeds, seven, eight hundred k's an hour or so, and it would just go hunt down U.S. Navy carrier groups. So that was the whole plan during the Cold War. And could you imagine how terrifying that would be, being in a, in a Navy convoy, and suddenly this low-flying jet comes up on the horizon and puts six cruise missiles into your ships and then disappears? Like <laughs> it would be, it would be so fast, so low that no one would see it coming. The, the Russians have come up with some crazy stuff. Everyone comes up with I mean, crazy stuff. If you're if you're listening to this, because you know we're we're obviously putting this, the podcast on Spotify and all the rest of it, so you obviously can't see this thing. So what should people go Google if they want to have a look at this? I think just the word Ekranoplan. Yeah, E K R A N O B L A N. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it basically looks like a weird jet with no wings that sits <laughs> on the water well sort of stubby wings yeah it's yeah. got like these hovering wing things and then there are these massive rocket launchers on the back and then the tail had massive radar it's a bizarre looking thing it is bizarre and, and it's and fascinating there's a really good james may uh, who i will always be a fan of old top gear james may he he did a very cool show i think for the discovery channel called james may's 20th century and he went to go drive slash float slash pilot one because he's a pilot so they let him actually fly one of these things and i mean it, it, it's literally it, it it flies what five meters maybe less off if, the if surface that. of the water yeah. so the stubby little wings so it can't really take off but it you know it can obviously get off the ground or off the water and i was just only the russians would have thought of this this is nuts yeah. this just doesn't make any sense <laughs> so i mean you know if if you're if you're doing 800 k's an hour and you happen to come across say a small tree you're screwed <laughs> yeah which is why yeah know, they're for water but yeah water and ice i mean it's it's an absolute marvel yeah i mean a crew of 15 i don't know what they all did but there was obviously a role mm. for everyone and this thing would go hurtling around so we'll put a link to this in the description um but a travel vlogger sn snuck onto this thing that we we're talking about the giant one i think it's the biggest one they ever made yeah so that it one, took loads of photos yeah that one's in the news because it was sitting in a shipyard somewhere, just falling to pieces, and they eventually decided, you know what, we're actually going to turn this thing to, into a museum. Now, it was barely seaworthy, so they had to do quite a bit of work to get it floating, and then they, they towed it and then just left it on a beach. Ah. And they, this was its temporary resting home, and of course people seeing it would be, oh, what's that? And they climbed aboard and took a whole bunch of photos and videos. Yeah, I love that story because she writes about how the, the security guard was on board, he was just asleep. So yeah, I just walked past him and just got lots of photos. <laughs> I love that. And then when they left, he was still asleep. Yeah. So they didn't get caught. Oh, that was good fun. Dave, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for joining me. No, thanks for inviting me. Let's do this again sometime. Yes, would absolutely love to. Uh, this has been episode three of the Cars at Coza podcast. If you missed episode one and two with uh, Ashley Oldfield as a guest and Hannes Oersthausen in episode two, you'll find them on our YouTube channel right now. It's very easy to find. Just hit YouTube and search Cars 
Cars Koza, or you can type youtube.com forward slash Cars Koza into your browser. Thank you very much for listening, stroke watching. And uh, we'll see you, see you next week, same time, same place on the internet uh, for episode four. Thanks, Dave. You're welcome. All right. Bye for now. We're out. Did you know that we also sell really awesome car themed merchandise? Check out our range of custom t shirts and prints at our online store now. Simply click on the square box on your screen and we'll take you there, or the link is in the description below. Thanks for watching.